Right, today we're going to look at this Merlin gauge drawer opener. Apparently it's dead and you can probably see the button here is a bit, um, yeah, we'll put it apart, have a look. Apparently someone's already opened this up and had a look and, well, actually I know they've already opened it up and had a look. If you're interested in repair videos, make sure you go and check out the other stuff down below. Keep the links down below in the description. Other things I fix. So this is skew if because the frame's snapped here, that just needs re-gluing. That's not hard. I'll fix that problem. Button is knackered. That is not clicking at all. That feels pretty awful actually. There's no sign of clicking on that. Is this battery got any power left in it? So battery still has power. 8.7 volts. That should be enough. Which means even if the switch is being constantly pressed it's not flattened the battery completely so that still works. Could use a bit of a clean up, a bit of flux on there and stuff like that. Dip switches, don't forget the switches, right? If I, knock, if I knock these switches, it won't work anymore. Note the switches. Yeah. There's the angle. In case I knock them. That switch doesn't work. That is not clicking at all. So that needs to be replaced. We'll start there. It's a nice common switch. Not a problem at all. Single sided board. Cheap circuitry, I suppose. It says so right there, 303 or 339 megahertz. 3.58, so that's the clock crystal for the chip. Also, that's tuning over here, so it's probably just a capacitive oscillator sort of thing. Let's replace the switch first. So, I've got this little kit here of you know switches and assortment, and these are done in height. And the height is actually from the base of the switch to the tip of the flunger, so you're not quite sure how to work these out. In this case, it'd be like there, right? Five mil, that's what you want. So, these little resonators here got three pins on them. What it is is basically a crystal. But it has capacitors built into it as well. So it actually has capacitors on each side, and the middle pins usually ground. The left and right pins are the actual connections for the resonator section, and the middle pin is ground, and you have a capacitor usually 20 picofarad or so between each of those right hand and left hand pins and ground pin. So it's like built in capacitors. That's often what they have. And if we look on this side, is that pin there, thicker trace? I believe that'd be a ground trace. And sure enough, the back wire goes to it. Because this is uh, soldered on the top side, not on the back side of the board, it's a bit harder because there's nothing to desolder on this side. So I have to desolder from this side, which means I can't just get like the desoldering gun on the legs and desolder them and then pop the switch out. I've got to desolder this with a soldering iron and just try and lever it out. Another way I could do this is to cut the legs off. That might actually be easier to do it that way. So we might actually do that. Just cut the legs off. We know the switch is bad, we know we have a replacement. So let's cut the legs. Desolder each one individually and that should actually be easier. Sometimes cutting through the legs is easy so I get something out. It's sure it's destructive, but we're not going to be using the switch again, right? It's definitely knackered, and I definitely have a replacement, so there's no point worrying about trying to get it out intact. This is pointless. And I wasn't recording a video then, because I'm an idiot. <laughs> I forgot to record that, but anyway, so I just forgot to record me soldering the switch on and discussing how important it is to not put too much heat into that switch and that sort of stuff. Anyway, the button is working, right? The LED is lighting up. So we're going to check this on a spectrum analyzer now and see what output is. Make sure that the output is definitely there in case there's some other problem going on. We also clean up the flux on this side now. The problem is with cleaning flux is it can affect the tuning. Now Iris circuitry does not like having flux left on it and the fact there is flux left on it means there's a good chance that if I clean it it will affect the tuning and throw it off. So if I can test it first, find out what frequency it's actually operating on where it's tuned to now, I can clean it and then make sure it's still on the same frequencies. Flux and RF gear do not mix. We've got the CMU200 set up here. As you can see, I've got a spike here. Oh, you've missed all the setup stuff. But... So analyze the settings. We've got a central 350 megahertz because that covered both frequencies of 303 and 300 and 339. 303 to 339 are the two frequencies this thing operates on. And so I took 315 with a span of 30 megahertz so I could capture the whole range. And then I push the button and we've got this little spike pop up because I've got peak hold set. Right, so it's going to catch a peak and that's it. That's what we're getting, and the markers is showing 303.220036 megahertz. So that's what we're getting right now. Whether that is correct for what it's supposed to be on, I don't know, but that's what we're getting. Now, now we have that reference frequency there, and we, and we know where we are, we can actually bring this in a bit closer. We'll make the span a bit less, let's go 5 megahertz, and we'll set the center at 303. Right, and we'll do the same again. Here we are. 
Look at all this noise here from this unit. Look at that. <laughs> Some quality there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that mess isn't supposed to be there. So I zoomed in a bit closer here. I'd actually do a 5 megahertz span just now, but I thought 10 megahertz shows it slightly better, really. And we're getting this interesting drop off here on frequencies. It's quite interesting. It's not quite what you expect. Let's do this again. So the carrier, then you've got that other bit filling in. It's probably like modulation or something like that. Maybe it's using FSK and it's causing a shift. FSK is frequency shift key. Could be that. It probably is FSK actually. Yeah, so it's working, but that's what we need to know is that that, that carrier peak there is marker peak again. 303.07. Let's go narrow again. So you can start to see the actual waveform here in the carrier a bit nicer. But there you go, you can see the waveform quite well there. So we've got this broad plateau here of the actual carrier. So 303.144, we'll go for that. That's looking roughly in the centre of that spike there. So I'll give this a clean, clean the flux off, and we'll make sure we're getting something like that again. So I've cleaned the flux off the circuit board. I'm not going to refresh the screen yet, because we know what we're getting here. I'm going to push the button, and we're going to see if it's changed. Where's it gone? <laughs> so, maybe it did change a lot. Let's increase the span. Let's go 5 megahertz. There we go. It shifted by a lot. Just by cleaning the flux off, doing nothing else. Peak. We changed by 1.5 megahertz by cleaning the flux off. Told you. Flux and RF circuitry, not a good mix. Now this circuit board does mention 303 megahertz, so I'm going to retune this thing to be exactly 303. I need a ceramic tuner for this, let me get one. So we need to bring this up, um, that centre's still the same isn't it, yes, so we need to bring this over to the centre over here. Actually I will turn off this peak hold. Um, levels, where is the peak hold, I've got to remember where it is on this thing. mode, OMS, repetition, continuous, display mode, maximum, average, current, let's try that, there you go, that's where it is, let's tune this to be 303 hopefully, which is about there, somewhere, That was 303.12 or something, wasn't it? It did change around a few things. So let's go up to markers. Peak. Even like you can see it drifting. That's 303.18. That's pretty close. But I think it should be exactly 303. That's what I'm thinking it should be. 303.09. Things when I take the screwdriver off it changes. 303.08. Yeah. Ish. 044. It's still basically where the original was, alright? So I think I'll be happy with that. Okay, that's good enough. Alright, so when I put this thing back into the housing, it did affect the tuning a little bit, and I put it into this side, which I was not surprised about. Sometimes doing that kind of thing does affect the tuning because the antenna system is part of the resonator circuitry of the oscillator and anything near the antenna can change the tuning so that's why I put it in the casing and rechecked it because I thought it might change and it did anyway the ball's looking a lot cleaner now <laughs> how it should have been from the factory now I'm going to put some glue on this little housing here to try and fix that broken button but it doesn't keep on slipping off and failing put some glue there pop it down that should be all we need. Need that to go off. Once that's dried, it should be good. Good as new, hopefully. <laughs>